take you on this, uh, I should call it a whirlwind uh, tour of uh, valvular heart disease in pregnancy in 12 and a half uh, minutes. Um, and uh, to kick off uh, straight away, in the 1990s, uh, we had the uh, deplorable situation in South Africa where the maternal mortality was in excess of 250 uh, deaths per 100,000 women. And uh, in response to that, the then Minister of Health in 1987 did two things. Firstly, he made maternal deaths a notifiable disease. And secondly, he appointed a National Committee on Confidential Inquiries into Maternal Deaths that was tasked into looking at this problem of high maternal mortality. The uh, lead author on that committee was uh, Professor Jack Moodley and uh, this publication uh, is the result of the deliberations of that committee published in the SAMJ in 2000 looking at the big five, the so-called big five uh, in terms of maternal mortality in 1998. And as Professor Buchardt pointed out, uh, hypertension uh, clearly was uh, by far the leading cause uh, and then amongst others there were HIV, uh, other obstetric complications, sepsis. But what I want to highlight is that medical causes of maternal mortality accounted for 10% of all deaths in women. Now, of interest is that the majority of these of deaths in the so-called medical group were in fact cardiovascular deaths. And although we don't have the information, but judging by uh, experience elsewhere, I would suggest that the, ma the majority of these deaths, in fact, are due to valvular heart disease. Now, the question then arises, is why does uh, pregnancy and valvular disease conspire to result in such an adverse outcome in pregnant women? And in part, uh, the explanation lies in the next uh, two slides. And as you can see, when we look at both mitral valve prolapse, as, uh, discussed, as uh, well described by Professor John Barlow, and rheumatic heart disease are both predominantly diseases of females. And in the right-hand panel, when one looks at the age distribution of both uh, rheumatic heart disease and myxomatous mitral valve disease, one can see that in fact these are diseases predominantly of the young. So, Mitral valve prolapse and rheumatic heart disease affects predominantly young women. And as you know, or I'm sure you know, that those are the very group of patients that tend to fall pregnant. <laughs> the second explanation for the bad outcome in patients with valvular heart disease uh, is given by this slide, which I must apologize for the clarity of the slide. But essentially it depicts the cardiocirculatory adaptations that occur during a normal pregnancy. And as you can see, uh, starting uh, almost at the time of uh, conception, uh, there is a progressive rise in the cardiac output which uh, continues to rise, albeit a little more slowly, throughout pregnancy. And that this increase in cardiac output is met both by an increase in the heart rate, depicted in the purple uh, dots, and an increase in the stroke volume uh, and these combine to increase the cardiac output and provide the, the uh, increased metabolic demands that pregnancy places on, a, on, the, on, the, on, the women, on the woman. Also at the same time there is a reduction in the hemoglobin due to a variety of factors which I won't discuss and there significantly is a drop in the total peripheral vascular resistance. Now this uh, increase in cardiac output is crucial to the progression of a normal pregnancy and clearly some valvular disease, predominantly the obstructive type, mitral stenosis, aortic stenosis, puts a choke on this increase in cardiac output and results in the adverse events that we see in pregnant women. The other difficulty arises from the fact that uh, Many of the symptoms that uh, women present with during pregnancy are very nonspecific and in fact are sometimes suggestive of heart failure. 
These are, this is a pie chart from the Baragwanath uh, Prospective Antenatal Cardiac Evaluation Registry of uh, 602 patients. And as you can see, uh, the majority of patients were referred for evaluation of dyspnea, almost one-third, uh, swelling of the feet in 15%, and a cardiac murmur in 25%. And as you know, functional murmurs are extremely frequent in, uh, in pregnant women. So that almost 70% uh, of patients are referred for one of those three symptoms. Now those are the same symptoms that can occur in a normal pregnancy. Those of you that have been pregnant would know that shortness of breath and swelling of the feet is extremely common. So how does one differentiate the normal symptoms that occur in a otherwise uh, well pregnancy versus those of cardiac disease? These are some of the clues and in fact we formulated criteria in this uh, registry uh, in order to help discriminate organic from functional symptoms. And if one takes these five symptoms, a, a previously normal pregnancy, uh, very mild symptoms, less than NYHA class 2, a systolic murmur that is less than 2 out of 6, the absence of any diastolic murmur and a normal ECG, then applying those criteria in a sensitivity uh, analysis uh, where echocardiography is the gold standard for diagnosing cardiac disease, then there are several factors that become evident. Firstly, as you can see in the top left-hand corner, the vast majority of women, 400 out of 602, in fact had a normal clinical exam and had a normal echocardiogram. So the majority of women that present to you with these symptoms will more than likely not have any significant underlying abnormality. In terms of the uh, uh, false positives and false negatives uh, and the, the appropriate uh, statistical calculations, you can see that both the sensitivity and the specificity of these clinical criteria that are highlighted are extremely good in excess of 90%. And that the negative predictive value is 96%. So in other words, if you don't any, have any of the clinical criteria that I outlined previously, it is highly unlikely that that patient has any significant cardiac abnormality. The difficulty arises in the positive predictive value of 81%, and that relates to the fact that many of these patients with their murmurs and swelling of the feet and increasing JVP and so on are mistakenly diagnosed as having cardiac disease, and uh, that in fact might well be a false positive. And in that group of patients, we would suggest that you perform echocardiography. So generally, uh, the clinical examination is quite accurate, uh, but echocardiography is an excellent way of confirming or excluding underlying cardiac pathology. Now the kind of valvular ab abnormalities that we're talking about are listed here. And uh, the ones that, uh, that signal uh, problems are the ones that are red flagged. And as you can see, uh, both uh, stenotic lesions, mitral stenosis and aortic stenosis, and then prosthetic valves are the three major conditions in which we encounter problems during pregnancy. The, uh, the uh, intervening two, uh, mitral and aortic regurgitation, in fact are generally tolerated quite well, and I will briefly discuss that later on. Now, we know from pre-surgical data from the 1950s and the 1960s that the survival of patients with mitral stenosis is heavily dependent on symptoms. And that patients who are functional class 3 to 4 have a 5-year survival of less than 50%. And in fact, if you're functional class 4, the 5-year survival is, uh, is almost 0%. Furthermore, we know from studies conducted in pregnant women that mitral stenosis confers an, an increased mortality both uh, in terms of maternal mortality and perinatal mortality and that in fact these are in some way similar to what we see in the non-pregnant population. In minimally symptomatic women, uh, functional class 1 to 2, the, uh, the death rate is less than 1%, whereas in patients that are significantly symptomatic, almost one-third of patients uh, could possibly have an extremely bad outcome. And likewise for the fetus, uh, the outcomes are highly dependent on maternal symptoms. Just several facts uh, regarding mitral stenosis. 
It's often diagnosed for, for the first time during pregnancy for the reasons that are outlined in terms of the uh, physiologic adaptations. The second point, and I think this is an extremely important point and applies not only to patients with mitral stenosis but also those in general terms with cardiac disease, that you can expect a one to two point decline in the NYHA class in patients who are pregnant. So if a patient enters pregnancy with functional class uh, one symptoms, uh, one can anticipate that that pregnancy will more than likely have a, a uh, fair outcome. On the other hand, if the patient enters pregnancy with functional class two symptoms and if they deteriorate by another uh, uh, one or two functional classes, uh, you can under well understand that uh, that patient will run into a lot of difficulty as, as the pregnancy advances. The greatest danger of uh, mitral stenosis, I should point out, is in late pregnancy, uh, during labor, when uh, the cardiac output increases even further, there's a huge sympathetic outflow, and in the early postpartum period when the uterus contracts and uh, injects another 500 mils or so of blood into the systemic circulation. Now, in general terms, most patients do very well just with diuretics and beta blockers. Beta blockers, as you know, reduce heart rate, prolong diastole, and allow better left ventricular filling, and have been shown to improve outcomes in these patients. In terms of anticoagulation, uh, the uh, suggestions are different for pregnant patients versus non-pregnant patients, and in general terms, anticoagulation is not needed unless the patient also has concomitant AF, that's atrial fibrillation, or has had previous embolism, in which case warfarin anticoagulation would be indicated. Now, there are three groups of patients that you can identify that uh, uh, are pregnant or wish to fall pregnant and have mitral valve disease. Firstly, there's the, pa the patient with mitral stenosis who desires to fall pregnant. And unfortunately, in the kind of situation that we uh, generally work in South Africa, these are the minority of patients. In other words, patients who know their underlying uh, cardiac abnormality but haven't yet fallen pregnant. In this group of patients, uh, most of whom luckily have a pliable valve, the current consensus would be to offer them a prophylactic mitral balloon valvotomy as indicated in that right panel. And these patients do extremely well uh, and the, they uh, conduct the remainder of, uh, of their pregnancy without any symptoms and without the need for any medical therapy. In the second group of patients who present with compensated mitral stenosis and who are already pregnant, which I think would be the, by far the majority of patients that we see at our antenatal clinic, the management principles are indicated on the right. Firstly, they need a careful follow-up. With a, together with an obstetrician and a cardiologist. Their medical therapy needs to be scrutinized and optimized uh, as best as one can. In terms of uh, delivery, this should be uh, an assisted uh, vacuum or forceps uh, delivery. And if despite all these measures, and also one needs to recommend bed rest uh, or minimal physical activity. And if despite all of these uh, suggestions, the patient remains symptomatic, then a mitral balloon valvotomy can be done during pregnancy. The question obviously is the, the optimal timing of the mitral balloon valvotomy and uh, by and large we would try and do it uh, in the, at the beginning of the second trimester when organogenesis has been complete and the risk of radiation to the fetus is minimal. And by and large with appropriate uh, protective measures to the fetus the results are very good. Now, unfortunately, there is a third group of patients who present in, a, in an advanced uh, and critical hemodynamic state, usually collapsed in pulmonary edema, who are septic, in renal failure, rapid atrial fibrillation, cardiogenic shock, and we see, unfortunately, one, one, or two, one to two patients like these uh, every month, and in these patients, the mortality, if not appropriately, appropriately treated, is almost 100%, and in them, I would suggest that one initiates a rapid trial of inotropes, diuretics, and antiarrhythmics. These patients should be intubated and ventilated, and if uh, uh, the valve is pliable, then one can consider an emergency mitral balloon valvotomy. If not, and we've had uh, two patients recently in whom we've put in an ECMO uh, device, uh, that's an extracorporeal membrane oxygenator, as a bridge to surgery, 
which would be mitral valve replacement. Now, in terms of mitral and aortic regurgitation, I just uh, want to gloss over this slide. Since the systemic vascular resistance is reduced in pregnancy, both of these lesions are, are tolerated very well during pregnancy, and uh, one hardly ever uh, uh, can ex uh, expect a bad outcome. Which brings me to the group of patients who are pregnant and who have prosthetic valves. As you know, we've been putting in prosthetic valves, both mitral and aortic, since the 1960s, with a variety of valves, uh, the uh, bi-leaflet uh, type valves, the single leaflet mechanical valve, both of which have excellent hemodynamics and low uh, thrombogenicity, the uh, more old-fashioned Star Edwards valve, I've lost my arrow, the Star Edwards valve, which is highly thrombogenic and not uh, used anymore, and then there are the tissue valves, or the so-called allografts or homographs, a stented valve and a uh, stentless valve, and more recently in the uh, in the uh, more recent uh, past decade, we've been putting percutaneous uh, aortic valves, as indicated in the bottom right panel. Now, the tissue valves have the advantage that they don't need anticoagulants. Unfortunately, the mechanical valves are thrombogenic, even the newer generation ones and require some form of uh, anticoagulation in all patients. And some uh, cardiologists uh, and clinicians have recommended that in patients who might potentially fall pregnant or of childbearing age, that one should use a tissue valve. This uh, teaching, I'm afraid, is extremely wrong, uh, since we know that 50% of these tissue valves degenerate during pregnancy. In fact, pregnancy accelerates the rate of degeneration of these valves, and that 50% of them need to be re-replaced. And clearly, the risks of a second operation uh, in a uh, young patient are always much higher. So I would dispense with uh, the tissue valves altogether. Now, regarding the mechanical valves and anticoagulation, it's essentially a balancing act where one's got to weigh the benefits and risks of uh, the anticoagulant both in terms of the fetus and in terms of the, the mother. Clearly in the mother the risks are those of mechanical valve thrombosis. In the fetus the risks are those of warfarin embryopathy, uh, intracranial bleeding and uh, excessive fetal wastage and loss. These are the various agents that we use during pregnancy. Warfarin, unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin and each of them has its uh, advantage and disadvantage. Clearly warfarin is taken orally, it's uh, easy to take uh, as opposed to the other two. The monitoring is quite easy with the INR as opposed to the PTT with unfractionated heparin and the more difficult and more expensive uh, antifactor 10A that needs to be measured in patients who are taking low molecular weight heparin. Embryopathy is predominantly a problem of warfarin. It occurs in about 2 to 3 percent of patients. Uh, it seems to be much less in patients who have a low warfarin requirement, less than 5 milligrams, uh, and is not a problem at all in patients on either of the forms of heparin since neither of them cross the placenta into the fetus. Intracranial bleeding is predominantly a problem with unfractionated heparin. Fetal loss, a problem with warfarin. Valve thrombosis, which uh, I will show you, I hope I will show you a slide of, is, has been documented to be the least with warfarin, uh, a little more with unfractionated heparin, and the most with low molecular weight heparin. So low molecular weight heparin, despite what other, whatever other advantage it might have, clearly uh, may potentially result in a thrombose valve, and that could result in maternal death because that is a catastrophic event. In fact, this is the wrong lecture. How do we summarize uh, the, uh, the problems of anticoagulation in pregnancy? And I like to always quote uh, Professor Celia Oakley, who is uh, my mentor at uh, the Hammersmith Hospital, uh, quite a forthright uh, woman, who made this statement that both warfarin and heparin carry hazards during pregnancy, but whereas warfarin brings a small risk to the fetus, Heparin jeopardizes a mother whose long-term safety is paramount. Clearly, you rather have an alive and well mother 
than an alive fe a baby and a dead mother. So in conclusion, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, pregnancy and valvular heart disease is common. Uh, it needs to be monitored uh, carefully by a team that comprises an obstetrician and a cardiologist. Uh, one needs to identify high-risk patients, which I think I've shown you you can do quite uh, accurately, and that in general terms, the outcomes of these patients are quite good. Thank you very much.